Greetings, everyone. P. Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House. I'm back from Washington, D.C., and alongside my good friend Martin Popoff, as uh, I do each and every Friday. Martin, good morning. Yes, morning, sir. Morning, sir. How how's she how's she going there? I know we talked a little bit about your Washington trip, but uh, yeah, yeah, you're a regular going down there, right? Eh? I'm a regular. I haven't been for almost three years, but yes, I'm back on the train once again. So uh, it was good to be there. And I think I got out of town just in time before they got hit with a storm, which hit us last night. But thankfully, I think the temps were just a little bit too warm for the snow. So we got like an all night of rain and slush and it's all rain right now. So I think we're in like mid thirties. So it's a little bit too warm for snow, but uh, that is so funny. You mentioned that because here they were planning for a massive snowstorm and they had the mayor on saying all the salt trucks are already and all this stuff. And we were supposed to get, you know, this much, maybe a foot of snow or something, but exactly the same thing. The temperatures were high enough that it's just been raining constantly. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I mean, I guess we dodge that bullet for now. Um, so we'll see what. Uh, How'd they get it so wrong, though? You know, that's the thing. I, yeah, Martin, don't get me started on this whole <laughs> th- these weather predictions, which are never right. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you would think you have you got the radar, right? You should be able to tell exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, it, it's never what they say. It's just like I mean, we talked about it all summer long, right? Oh, sixty yeah. percent chance of rain today. Nothing every day yeah. they would say yeah. that, and we had like those two months of no rain, and every day they called for rain. I'm like, what are these people doing? They're paid to make these predictions, and they're wrong every time. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I want that job. That, that sounds like an easy job, right? <laughs> Do these people get fired when they make these wrong predictions, right? Or or yeah, you can't yeah. fire someone, I guess, when the radar is showing you what's going to happen. I don't know. Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've got a, a fun show for you here today, which, as Martin and I were just talking before we went uh, live, uh, is probably going to be a two-parter. Uh, that's going to be the set part two is going to be slightly related or very related sort of. Uh, and, you know, we've we've been talking for the last few weeks about we want to do some theme shows on this whole hair slash glam metal i'm going to continue to use hair slash glam metal because i know there's a lot of people out there who hate the hair metal term we get it all right don't shoot the messengers we didn't create the term right it's just it's been used for 30 plus years um but some people like feel more comfortable with glam metal anyway uh we were talking about this concept of when hair metal or glam metal grew up Right. So this is post 1990 when the musical climate is shifting. All of a sudden, the sounds from Seattle are flying in. Everybody's talking about Nirvana and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and Mudhoney and and all these other bands. And all of a sudden, the the hair metal, the glam metal bands are like, oh, uh, people aren't buying our albums. They're not coming out to see us in concert as much as they used to. And they're not playing us on the radio and MTV. These guys with the uh, with the flannel shirts are getting all the attention. We got to do something different, right? So a lot of these bands uh, had to move on from the stuff they were doing and even the image that they were portraying in the 80s. And, and some of them did some really cool things moving into the 90s. And all of a sudden, uh, this concept that we were talking about, about hair metal or glam metal kind of growing up and uh we picked picked like five albums from five very notable bands that were kind of lumped in with this whole glam hair metal thing and uh some albums that they recorded post 1990 that kind of show lots of maturity uh and and a um a kind of a way to escape some of the trappings of the 80s that they were currently toiling in and moving into some new sounds, new looks, that sort of thing, where all of a sudden you can say, hey, these bands kind of went on and did something kind of cool after what they were doing in the 80s and uh, as a response to everything that was changing around them. And uh, so I'll let Martin kick us off with his first album. Maybe he wants to expand a little bit on that. Yeah, that's that's a perfect explanation. Uh, but I'm looking at my main examples here. I've got I've got honorable mentions as well. But I'm looking at my main examples, and you know they all they all have a little bit of a different story. Um, but I'm but I'm noting that uh, some of my examples here, um, or or many of them, uh, it's a slightly different story in that um, I'm surprised to see that some of these kind of start a little a little later. But uh, we'll go through them as we go here. So uh, so yeah, that's right. So. My first example, um, so yeah, the idea here is that um, I, I love this whole idea of, you know, when I did this, um, I did this book uh, called The Big Book of Hair Metal, which was a timeline and quotes thing. And I ended it, I closed, I closed the gate, you know, because you got to close it somewhere. I closed the gate with uh, Nirvana's Nevermind coming out. And then I thought, wow, this is a real, real shame, you know, because there's a lot of good stuff that came later. And both of us kind of, you know, that this the, the theme of this episode is that, you know, 
a lot of our favorite hair metal albums come when hair metal's dead kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the idea here. And uh, so my first example is uh, Enough's Enough from Chicago. So here's their 1989 album. And as you can tell on the back, they're still looking pretty hair metal. But, you know, this is late. This is late in, in, in how it's all coming out. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about Enough's Enough is that um, they're kind of considered, you know, with Donny V and Chips Enough, um, Donny V's vocals and uh, just the whole sort of complexion of the band and coming from Chicago. And of course, we know mm. Cheap Trick comes from Rockford, Illinois. Um, they're considered, um, you know, the short story, the elevator pitch on them. You know, if 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 you if you got into an elevator with Donny Donny V and he's trying to get get a get a record deal, you know, he he would just turn to the guy and say, "We're uh, we're the hair metal version of Cheap Trick." Right. And, uh, you know, that's exactly what they were. Can't miss, um, can't miss with us. <laughs> yeah. But but you look at this and, uh, you know, it's uh, the name. The name is so hair metal. It's like ridiculously hair metal. It's actually, frankly, a really stupid name. Um, but um, like like the theme of this episode, you get to their second album. The album cover gets better. Yeah. You know, yes, they still got the peace sign. Uh, it's called Strength. So they're moving into that grunge one word title thing. Um you know, on the back cover, it's a black and white photo. They're looking a little more like Mother Love Bone than than they did on, uh, you know, the 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 debut. You know, the, the clothes are maybe toned down a little, but maybe it's more like just a black and white photo. But the idea here is that um, subtly, subtly, number one, as a late period hair metal band, they were already really interesting and really cool. They did have that very melodic sort of Beatles-esque, even a little bit of Elvis Costello and Joe Jackson and what they're doing, but more so, more so like truth. They are the hair metal version of Cheap Trick. They had a really kind of neat, glammy, a lot of melodies, really good songwriting. Loved them right from the start. But uh, along with the theme here, they get even more so on here. Like this is just more sophisticated than the next album's called Animals with Human Intelligence. And, uh, you know, actually on the album cover is not as good as these ones, but um, they actually still look kind of hair metal-y on that. But, um, you know, they're moving on. Hair metal's kind of dead. They still have their major label deal, even with that third album. But the whole idea is that... Um, uh, along with the theme of this episode, really interesting proposition to this band. They're just really kind of a cool band that you don't think of as a regular hair metal band. Everybody thought they were great songwriters. And yeah, they have that. They're, they're almost like they're almost like uh, the hardcore version of Cheap Trick. You know, as hardcore as to punk, it's like if Cheap Trick is not being Cheap Trick enough like for you, uh, you've got enough's enough over here, which is which is like heavy Cheap Trick hair metal, cheap trick, you know, big guitar riffs, super melodies. So they're almost like, like if cheap trick has disappointed you recently, well, you've got enough's enough replacing them. So it's like hardcore replacing punk or whatever. Right. Um, so yeah, that's my first example of just a band being really, really good in this pocket. Once hair metal is supposedly dead. You know, it's funny uh, seeing as how cheap trick was struggling so mightily in the late eighties it's probably kind of cool that a band like enough's enough came and touted that whole, well, we're, we're the more, you know, rock and ballsy version of cheap trick um, yeah. at a time where cheap trick, you know, fame, we're losing lots of fans and people probably wondering, uh, you know, is there any life left in this band, which they obviously proved that there was uh, into the nineties yeah. and further on. So uh, yeah, good choice. All right. My first uh, pick of the day is extreme with their album, three sides to every story from 1992. So obviously Extreme burst on the scene in the late 90s towards the tail end of the of the hair metal era or the glory days with their self-titled album and then of course Pornography, which was a huge hit for them. And again, it's maybe a little arguable whether Extreme were ever really part of this whole scene to begin with, because I always thought their music was a little bit different is that they had that whole kind of funk metal aspect of their music. But, you know, you kind of look at the the the, the their photographs on the first two albums and they, they kind of looked the part. Right. Um, <clears throat> but then all of a sudden, you know, 1992 comes around. This is, this is already the whole grunt scene is in full swing. Uh, and all of a sudden they receive they, they release this concept album, which is basically, it's an album to, 
divided into three sides, so to speak. And each side uh, has a specific concept, both musically and lyrically. Uh, you got the the yours side, which is the the total funk metal, very similar to the music from their first two albums. Lots of guitars, lots of grooves, right? It rocks big time. Uh, the second side is called mine, and that's here it's more kind of ballady driven strings and keyboards and you have this um very huge influence of some of the more melodic epic sounds of maybe queen and then you got the last side which is called the truth which is like 20 like a 20 minute suite and that's blends in prog and just more theatrical type music and all of a sudden you're like wow this and again this this album <clears throat> didn't really do well that kind of went over the heads of people because i think by the time we got to the, the second side mine i think most of the hardcore extreme fans kind of lost them you know they like the first side is great yeah warheads is great rest in peace cupid's dead peacemaker die this is all what i like from extreme and then all of a sudden you got all this prog and all this like pop and, and ballads and it's just like uh and for the fans who i think jumped on the queen the extreme bandwagon with more than words which we've talked about before was never representative of what this band was all about this is even further removed from that so uh i, I and this kind of kind of killed their career, even though, and we write this catalog and we, this is to us, this is their crowning achievement, but at the time, not really looked at that way, <clears throat> but a perfect example of a band who decided, okay, we had our, we, we had our, those two really fun albums. We were playing along to what everybody else is doing. Now we're going to do something really serious that we really want to do. Uh, and we're not going to go anywhere near what the what the grunge guys are doing. We're going to kind of do our own thing. We're going to look at our influences, put together something that's really challenging. And artistically speaking, this works. This is an absolute home run, whether the masses liked it or not. And then, you know, even on their next album, they continue to kind of move away from those early sounds that they were doing. So to me, I really have a lot of respect for this band for doing something like this even like you know the album itself it's like you only get a little bit of glimpse of what they look like here these little boxes it's very kind of ambiguous and just kind of like you know whereas you look like i said the first two albums and all the photography you know they're, they're showing themselves off and like all right we're, we're kind of fitting in with the scene this is like the anti anti-glam anti uh hair metal so yeah um excellent excellent album all grown up now, extreme, all grown up. Unfortunately, they haven't done a lot since this, but this album. But uh, what are you going to do? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's interesting. So, number one, they didn't go at all grunge. They even went even more pristine and clean with the recordings. They possibly went a little more Queen as well. Um, yeah. They're just like we want to be a universal just a loved rock band that doesn't fit in any categories. And then the last thing I want to say is, is pornography is a perfect example of, of an album operating in this, in this space after Nirvana where they're squarely still in the, in the hair metal lane, but they're just really, really good at every single aspect of hair metal. They're like the best hair metal band you can. And that's basically the theme of this episode, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's uh, to me, extreme, there's an artsiness or a willingness to or want a desire to be an artful band that I think, you know, maybe some of the other ones didn't really have, right? That there's a craft to the songwriting and the arranging and whatnot, which the Queen is a perfect, uh, you know, example to bring up. And we know they were big Queen fans or are big Queen fans. So, uh, yeah, it just it kind of set them apart in a, in a big way. Yeah. All right. OK, so my next example is, uh, like I say, one of these that's a little off base because Jackal from Atlanta. So here's their first album. Uh, it's basically a, uh, you know, a, a redneck hair metal album, a, a, a bluesy hair metal album, a dirty hair metal album, whatever you want to call it, a southern rock heavy uh, hair yeah. metal album. You look at them on the back. They look like your basic hair metal band. But it's 1992 already, which is really bizarre. So it's mm -hmm. like they get to, they, it, it's too long to get going, um, but they arrive and they've got a lot of personality and it's a little different and already it's new and improved hair metal. So they actually do quite well with this. Um, but um, 
you know, the, the second album is considered a little bluesy. Some of the edges are, are kind of off mm. and, it, and it wasn't that well received. But the one I love to death is Cut the Crap with that terrible album cover. <laughs> but this album, I just play all the time. And now we're already up to 1997 and they really haven't changed their sound that much. They're like an ACDC slash hair metal band still. So they essentially arrive late, stay in that lane that they're in, which is a, you know, quote unquote, you know, Southern rock hair metal band. There's your elevator pitch again. Um, but this is, it's just so really, it's got a great crisp recording. It's, it's more vital than even the debut and the second one in that, um, I guess, I guess it seems a little more street, like, uh, like a little less, uh, you know, they're impinged upon by, by corporate concerns and you got to go have a hit and all that stuff, even though, yeah, they're, they're still on their major label at this point. Um, picture of the band there all li lined up in suits going into the porta potty. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess it goes along with the cut the crap. And this is the one that's got the, um, the Brian Johnson co-vocal on one song. Um, it's such a great album. Uh, and, you know, remember way back when, when we did that, uh, that um, uh, guilty pleasures episode, right. Yep. Uh, kind of thing. It, this, this almost <clears throat> is like a guilty pleasure in that, in, in that, like, why am I playing Jackal all the time? And why is it cut, the cut the crap album that I'm going to all the time? Right. <laughs> so yeah, there's a funny one, uh, 92 and 94 and, and they're in there, they're touring. I saw them back up Aerosmith um, on a tour. Um, so right off the bat um, it's, it's late hair metals kind of over, but they're smart enough like the extreme example that they're bringing a lot to the table immediately. So they're kind of allowed to live. And they're and they're and they're kind of fresh in that they're a new band uh, in this thing that's still doing hair metal. So possibly they got a little bit of accolades and a little bit of attention because everybody's abandoning ship and they're still kind of on this ship. And they do it with that and they do it with push comes to shove. It's it's kind of like they they're just keeping on keeping on sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jackal are, are a really intriguing band for me because they they arrived in the middle of that whole scene and they kind of looked the part somewhat and aspects of their music kind of fit. But to me, they were always like a real kind of uh, sleazy sound in Southern rock band. Uh, and again, you, you, the ACDC comparison is also spot on. And uh, I, I always thought that, that Jackal were like, one hit single away from being a huge band because they never quite got there but there there were a band that everybody was kind of knew about kind of liked i never met anybody who said oh jackal they're terrible right there was a jackal yeah they're a pretty cool band right not oh, the chainsaw thing yeah you know that's kind of neat that's fun right like a, f a really fun band that has kind of like persevered all these years it's uh i know i've told this story before i, ho I hope i haven't told, told it on a on um on one of our episodes before, maybe I have, but uh, it's, it's very short, but I mean, I remember sitting on the bus with the Jackal guys and, uh, and the guitarist, you know, we had our latest issue of brave words of bloody knuckles with, with a mortal on the cover. Right. So, so a bath in his full makeup and stuff. And, he, and, and the guitarist, I can't remember his name, but he's going really sincerely. It's like, Martin, Martin, explain this to me. What what is going on with this thing? <laughs> Just that is the funniest thing, right? And he sincerely wanted to know, like, what what is this black metal thing? Like, they're the the most opposite of black metal that you could possibly be. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Martin, could you explain this to me, please? <laughs> it's yeah. like this does not compute what is this guy doing with yeah. his makeup and like the, the, the spikes yeah. and all that shit? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's it's to him, it's probably completely foreign, right? I mean, uh, at, yeah, black metal is not for everybody, folks. We totally get that, and he, even other musicians who probably should be aware of all this stuff, yeah. All right, uh, next band and album. So, this is a band that, uh, back in the day only released two albums, another one came out later on. Uh, the first album came out basically again towards the tail end of hair metal's you know, big glory years. And to me, they got lumped into this kind of style of music um, based on, I think, just the fact that it was, if you, if you can't, if you were a heavy, heavy band and you had long hair and you had somewhat of a look, it's almost like it didn't matter what, what the album sounded like. You were a glam and hair metal band. Uh, the band is Badlands and the album is 1991's Voodoo Highway. So if ever I, I forgot to grab it, but if everybody remembers their first album, the self-titled album, 
you got them on the front. You got a black and white photo of them on the front, and they kind of, they look pretty good, right? They look kind of hair metally, glam metally. Uh, but if you go into the album, uh, it's just really good bluesy heavy rock. Yeah, there are a couple tracks that are kind of commercial sounding and hooky, right? So uh, a lot of people just kind of lump them in. Ah, they're glam metal band, even though, you know, some of the guys, you got Jakey Lee coming from Ozzy. You got Ray Gillen, who had a couple cups of coffee with Black Sabbath, right? Did a little time in Blue Murder before Badlands started out, right? So there's this kind of connection with most of the guys in the band. Uh, but by the time the second album comes around, all of a sudden, you don't see them on the cover. And the pictures on the back, all of a sudden, they're looking kind of 70s, right? They're not, you know, they got the, the cowboy hat. Well, you know, the cowboy hat kind of is a little bit of a giveaway. But they all of a sudden have a grittier look. And this album is a little bit darker and a little bit more bluesy than the debut. And I think uh, really, to me, uh, almost as strong as the debut and further kind of cemented the fact that they are a serious hard rock band. Uh, you got some great, you know, The Last Time, Shine On, Whiskey Dust. I mean, there's even like some kind of like heavy Southern rock stuff going on here that is not that much different than, you know, what bands like Molly Hatchet, Blackfoot, and Skinner were kind of doing right around the same time. Uh, and to me, I always thought the music of this album was them really trying to distance themselves away from the perception that was given to them on their debut album. Uh, but, you know, again, by 1991, people are moving on from this stuff in droves. It's like Nirvana and all those other bands we mentioned before are grabbing all the attention. And instead of this band after this album saying, OK, now what do we do? Let's try something different. The band basically imploded. And that was that, which is a shame because I, I don't think we ever really got to see Badlands fully fulfilling their vision uh post the first two albums and certainly this one because i think they you know, again there's some really good stuff on that third album that got released many years later but uh it, it's just a shame that um a band like this didn't get to put out their like magnum opus so to speak but but this was a step in the right direction again and again they're they, they're grabbing all their 70s influences here and saying all right you may think we're a glam or a hair metal band but we're going to show you that we're we're about more than that we're going to show you we love mountain and we love free and bad company and all that kind of stuff so uh to me a, a much more grown-up album although i still like the first album a little bit better but this has taken them in directions that i think would have continued on had they stayed together Wow, interesting because I've got the exact same story for you. And uh there's with a few the band, of these more. Yeah, there's a few yeah, of this, these stories. This, yeah. this band is is actually in the same uh, area of your CD collection as well. And, and like I say, it's the exact same story. So Black Crows. Yep. So exact same thing. Uh you get you get an album that's a little more hair metal adjacent for the debut. And the elevator pitch here is like, oh, whoa, we're hair metal crossed with the faces or the stones, right? Yep. Um so that's where we're coming from. And, and apparently, um, you know, I don't know a lot about the history of the band, but apparently they were kind of like a Paisley rock band before. So they were a little more alternative and then they went into this direction. But the interesting thing is, so you start with something that's a little safer that you could say, yeah, it kind of fits enough. And uh, like the Badlands, you know, it's it's well, it's actually much more of a success in the Badlands album. But you get to the second one and uh, all of a sudden they're bluesier, they're folkier. Uh, they're they're much more southern rock. This thing is a masterpiece. It's a it's an amazing record. It it did better than the debut. They were seen now as much more serious artists. So it's literally like their version of a voodoo highway. But of course, uh, you know, Badlands sadly was going to lose their singer and all sorts of uh, you know problems with the label. And Black Crows just kind of went up and up. Uh, although the record started selling less than this. Uh, you know, eventually, I mean, Amorica did well as, as well, but so they became uh, an even more respected band than they were here. They became almost like a, uh, a Pearl Jam type situation <clears throat> where, um, you know, they, they were, they were kind of a cult band. They could always get a good crowd out. They would jam, they would have odd set lists. There was always the drama between Rich and Chris. Um, but, you know, to, to put this back in our hair metal situation, um, you know, he, here, here, they were they were allowed to live and they were kind of part of it and they, they were they thought they were better than hair metal but they were they were basically they belonged essentially and it was it was the same people buying it but you get up to this and they, and they're like you know we're we're treated like serious artists it's not nearly it's not a hair metal album at all it just it's just kind of an ex hair metal band um and um 
and they're not doing grunge. We know that as well. They're they're not trying to be a grungy band. Um, but although on on some of the later albums, you know, because they really mixed it up and they were really creative, they did have some things with some some sort of dirty dirtier textures and lower payoffs and it's funny you mentioned voodoo highway one thing you think about when you think about that album is is the riffs don't have the payoffs they aren't as catchy it's not the money riff all the time and that's and that's kind of a little bit what black crows starts to do here but they definitely do on later albums where there are some some of the fans complain about some of those albums that they're not catchy enough right yeah yeah that, yeah, Black Rose is a perfect example of this. I mean, some of those later albums post the debut are really musically challenging and filled with lots of variety. I mean, this I, I have grown a really strong appreciation for those latter period. And I, and I say latter period, meaning everything after the first album. Uh, those albums, I think, are absolutely terrific. And I remember when the debut first came out, I was really into it. Then I kind of lost interest in it. And then I got back into the band later on. And now I think uh, I don't look as fondly on the debut as I used to. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. But man, I think they they really grew up after that debut and kind of really started doing. I think the debut was more of kind of like, well, this is the times uh, we're going to make an album that's going to fit into what every, everything else, everybody else is doing. We're going to still show a little bit of our love for the Stones and the Faces, but we're going to do an album that's perfectly perfect will perfectly appeal to people who like Guns N' Roses and all these other bands. And then they realize, well, that's really not us. So um, did you ever read that uh, Steve Grossman's autobiography? No, I hear it's one of the best autobiography or biographies, period, rock books, period. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. I was completely yeah. engrossed in that. Uh, what a great story. Yeah. Um, and what, what a dysfunctional band. Holy cow. Yeah, that that's one of the best uh, rock bios or autobiographies I've ever read. It's yeah. amazing. Amazing. And, and whether that's I, I don't think it's more I don't think it's so much his ability as a writer as this as it as it's it's just such a great story and it's such a gripping story at times it's a tragic story um incredible incredible if anybody thinks that the rock and roll lifestyle is boring read steve grossman's book because yeah. sure as hell ain't and especially when you're talking about the black crows yeah crazy all right uh my next choice so uh i'm going to show their debut album first because you have to when you talk about cinderella so, of course, this is like, you know, the poster child for what is a glam rock or hair metal band in the 80s. And, uh, of course, as we know, there is always this blues element to their music uh, that always kind of came through. But you watch the videos from stuff from this album or even the second album, uh, you know, and all the big catchy choruses and, you know, the hair and the scarves and the makeup and all this flashy clothes. And this just screams hair metal even though i think deep down inside tom Kiefer always wanted to kind of do something else um he's got this kind of brian johnson-y voice which i think is kind of neat and didn't really fit in with all the kind of sugary sweet uh, vocalists that were you know kind of permeating this kind of style during the 80s but then uh, 1994 they release uh what would be their fourth and final album called still climbing and as you can see there's no pictures of them with the scarves and the big teased hair anywhere in sight. It's rather kind of bleak and plain looking. Uh, and, you know, this is, I think, the album that this band always wanted to do. This is more of a, a hard edge kind of blues album. Um, the, the If you look at like photos and when videos of them from this time period, they've really toned down the image. And here they're just letting their kind of love for the blues and hard rock kind of do the talking. Um, the, this album is barely a hit or anything that could resemble a hit on the album. Uh, it's just littered with his big gritty guitars, you know, along with Jeff Labar, those snarling vocals. Um, you know, all comes down is about as close to like a party anthem as you're going to get on this album. The rest of it's foot stomping, heavy blues, bad attitude, shuffle, talk is cheap, uh, blood from a stone, freewheeling, really good title track. Um, they even add horns on a couple couple songs. Would you have heard horns on like a, a Cinderella album in 1987 or 88? Probably not. You wouldn't have heard on a Perfect Poison album and that kind of stuff. Um, basically, when you listen to this album, it comes across as a little bit more adventurous and intricate bluesy acdc album and it's a lot of fun in the process not that this isn't because this is a killer album 
But I think, again, this is another example of one of these bands that finally decides we're going to do something that we really want to do that isn't this uh, and make a really honest record now that this kind of stuff is falling out of favor. And again, sadly, this is their last album, right? So it's almost like it's kind of similar to the Badlands situation. It's like uh, something like this could have continued them on for many, many years doing stuff like this. Didn't happen, though. But good stuff nonetheless. Yeah, that is so bizarre that that's their last album, eh? Yeah. 94, yeah. wow. And, and you know, they kind of regularly went out on tour and stuff. And, yeah, it's, it's really bizarre. Right? How, many, how many bands are there really like that that really close the gate, right? Like, everybody usually eventually does an album, right? So yeah, it, it's strange, yeah, exactly. Eh? And 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 sli- and they were, all these albums are big sellers. You know, Long Cold Winter did really well. Even uh, Heartbreak mm-hmm. Station did mm-hmm. fairly well. And this was, you know, the album that that basically was the precursor to this one because this is still kind of with one foot in one camp and one foot in the other whereas i think we're still climbing they basically said okay we're done with that this is what we're going to do now and uh you know they they weren't obviously you know these albums were not selling as well the latter period ones and uh that was that and they never looked back and that was that was the end we've seen tom do you know this solo thing and he plays lots of cinderella songs and but yeah as a band yeah that was that And, and a dream theater album cover on that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my next one also fits this idea that, uh, well, they actually weren't there in the eighties, but the interesting case, um, kind of a guilty pleasure again, kick Tracy. So this is like the baby slaughter. And this is like a really screechy high recording and, uh, Steven Chiro on vocals. Um, you know, and again, speaking of dream theater album covers, there's a, there's another one for you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at the band on the back and they're looking fairly hair metal. But so here they are. It's just a band arriving late. Um, and in this case, they happen to be it's um, it's just a really good quality, interesting, slightly dangerous hair metal band. So it's so it's like uh, it's like extreme on the second album or or where, you know, all the examples we have here where where you're moving away and you're just being a little more creatively fearless and interesting. And again, um, you know, we 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 neglect to mention. But but again, a lot of this is coming because, um, you know, grunge is pretty impressive. It's pretty creative and interesting and dangerous and uh, and quite quite anti-commercial yet you know it's no fault of theirs that they those records sold multi-platinum but they're really all interesting albums so the idea here is that even if you're going to be in a lane and and do and do uh hair metal albums um and uh you know late and you know the label the clock is just they're just looking at their watch and saying look we're going to put this thing out but it's over for you making this kind of record music um but um, if you are going to make this kind of music, um, you know, I feel that even if there's no grunge to it at all, they're inspired by the creativity of grunge. And then, you know, they only get to make a, an EP for their next one. Right. And there they are. They're still looking kind of hair metal, but it's, yeah. you know, kind of psychedelic <clears throat> badlandsy looking hair metal kind of yeah. look to them. Right. Uh, you know, they got the jeans going and stuff, but still the long hair. But yeah, just an interesting band that, um, again, kind of like a jackal stayed in the lane um, because it, it's probably, you know, it's, it's too late to change course. This is who we are. We've got our major label deal. This is what they want from us. I guess we got to do this um, yeah. kind of thing. So it's, it's an odd, it's an odd thing where it's like the band and the label and everybody knows that the timing was off, but we're going to put this out anyways. And then it doesn't do that great, but it does. Okay. Because again, the, the ship is, the ship is hard to steer. The ocean liner is hard to steer. And frankly, even habits are hard to break where, you know, a lot of these albums we're talking about here still do pretty well in the marketplace, even though it's apparently over. But the point is, is that all the fans are still programmed to think that way. The memory is still there. It's it's a gradual decline. It's not a shutting of the door with Nirvana. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, all the ones we've talked about so far still were fairly successful albums for the most part, um, yeah. but not selling, you know, multi-platinum like they were five years before, or two years yeah. before, or three years before. So. Yeah. All right, so my next choice is another band, again, kind of kind of like Bad Lindsay, but even more so of a band that got lumped into the whole hair metal thing, uh, not so much because of the way they sounded, or in this case, even the way they looked, but just because they kind of debuted in 86 when this style of music was just flying high. And if you sold lots of records and you had lots of videos and you weren't thrash, 
uh, you kind of got lumped into this glam, glammy scene, right? And that's Tesla. The album is Psychotic Supper from 1991. So their first two albums did really, really well for themselves. Um, again, to me, to my ears, this band was always kind of like a heavier take on like mid 70s Aerosmith and maybe a little Led Zeppelin. Uh, bluesy, yet metallic, fairly heavy, uh, just as capable of putting together like a crunchy headbanger of a song as well as a softer ballad or a, you know, kind of like a bluesy rave up, right? Uh, and, and Psychotic Supper kind of continues that formula. Although here, I think this is even a little bit grittier. You got, um, you know, Edison's Medicine, which is kind of bluesy, but it's quite heavy. Lots of guitar on this uh, on this album. Don't de-rock me, Song and Emotion, uh, Time, which has got lot, lots of Zeppelin things. And, you know, Freedom Slaves. And, uh, you know, the one interesting thing about this album, which I think is totally, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, not indicative of the bands, of these hair metal bands in the 80s, is this album is completely like politically charged from a, a lyrical perspective. And you didn't really have a lot of the hair metal bands who were deviating from the sex, drugs, rock and roll type of lyrical concept here. And here you got this band that is like got these lyrics that are kind of angry about the establishment, about things going on in Washington, politics and whatnot. You even have some uh, Black Crows style rootsier rock on this album as well. So I think I think the influence of the Black Crows on the scene was was really, really strong right around this time. So, you know, you know talk about it is another really cool song again it's got this kind of like it's kind of groovy it's kind of funky it's kind of rootsy um call it what you want what you give these are all songs that i don't think this band would have done on their first two albums but i think after the the explosion of the black crows it was kind of a lot of these bands thought it was okay to do stuff like that um to me this band kind of always was no frills no gimmicky images just good old-fashioned rock and roll and I think they really were happy, probably, uh, that the kind of whole glam scene was kind of dying down. They could just be themselves and not get kind of lumped in with that. And they can, you know, this album sold really well. Their follow up album did really well. But again, they succumbed to what all the other bands were doing at the time. And their they, their sales started to decline. Grunge bands were, were taking up all the, you know, the spotlight. And uh, but Tesla's still going strong to this day. So uh, that's my pick here. Yeah. And Jeff Keith even looked a little bit like Chris Robinson, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. He did. <laughs> and you forgot that, you know, Def Leppard is a big influence, right? So, so uh, yeah. high, uh, high and dry pyromania era De Def Leppard. Yep. And, um, and that, yeah, this is the only band uh, notoriously who later on took that Def Leppard influence and said, we're going to make it, we're going to be influenced by poppy Def Leppard for an album or two. Right. And yes. that was horrible. Right. And we're even uh, going to have one of their, uh, one of their members produce the album. Right. To make oh it even God. more like Def yeah. Leppard. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And so ironically, about, Warren, that is the worst album in their catalog. Yeah. Yeah. And remember we, you know, jumping the shark, this is a jumping the shark moment. It's like, yeah. okay, well we were like Def Leppard in a good way. Why don't we just be like Def Leppard in a bad way? Sure, right? why not? We're not going to be Tesla yeah. anymore. We'll be Def Leppard now. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So my last example, maybe a little predictable um, because people know I love this band love hate. They start out in 1990. So they're a late one, you know, weird album cover, strange name, but it's pretty hair metally. They look pretty hair metally. Everybody loves this album. It's considered it's widely, you know, it's well regarded as a, as like a, like a, a kick in the butt to guns and roses sort of thing. Uh, just really cool lyrics, kind of decadent, kind of druggy, but their second album is an absolute masterpiece. I think it's the greatest hair metal album of all time. Um, I even like the photo of the band on the back looking real doorsy there with Jizzy Pearl. You know, he looks like a doors guy, he, you know, he acts and sings everything like a doors guy. But um, basically, um, basically this record is meticulously recorded. It's progressive. The songwriting is amazing. It's really heavy. Uh, it's got great bass playing on it, great singing, great lyrics. Um, they're still, they still have their major label, but it's the perfect example. Um, I, like I say, it's an absolute masterpiece. It should have been super huge. It's anthemic. Um, 
but um, it's just arriving like two years too late kind of thing. It's 1992. Um, I think they had some drug problems in the band as well. Um, but basically, I'm sure their label is just is just, again, looking at their watch saying it's up for you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, you know, you you know, this this kind of stuff ain't too good. You, yeah, you you are. You are seven or eight times better than anything Guns N' Roses ever did. But um, it's too late. Um, that that's kind of the problem. And then and then even the next album is amazing. But they're off their major label. Actually, they're on to they're on to like RCA at this point in 1993. So they're losing, you know, the pure major label deal with Sony. And, and they've got kind of this smaller label and this weird kind of, you know, um, you know, monotone ish sort of album cover art. And the back looks really indie. But this is still an amazing album as well. Um, but yeah, just another example of, um, you know, they're, they're actually, you know, they're they're actually uh, I, I hate to even say it, but they're actually kind of a pure hair hair metal band. But they're just like the very absolute best example of it. Everything you love about hair metal is is on there and everything you hate about hair metal isn't on there. Um, but but they're but they're kind of still really pretty much in in that in that lane. I mean, the album's called Wasted in America, right? It's it's a perfect hair metal al album title, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, so love, hate, love them to death. Uh, anybody, you know, if you haven't checked out Wasted in America, just play that thing. You will be amazed at the riffs on there and the songs like one after another, just so strong all the way through. Yeah, you turned me on to that album. I picked it up and I was like, wow, the musicality of this band is off the charts. I mean, I absolutely yeah. love the guitar work on the album and the grooves are enormous. And to yeah. me, um, that album reminds me of if you were to like perfectly blend the best of Guns N' Roses with the musicality of Extreme and that's Love Hate. Yeah, And it's just a, a really well-crafted album. And again, the band should have been huge. It's got it's got all the it factor all over. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so my last uh, choice here for today. Then now we're going to go way in the future. So this is a band that uh, made a lot of waves in during the height of hair metal or glam metal, uh, based on their look, based on their music. Uh, but they were a little different because they were a Christian band, and uh, then they kind of went away for a while and uh were very inactive and then they came back and started doing albums that still kind of kept up the spirit of the hair and glam metal scene of the 80s but they decided that we're going to kind of tone down maybe the the overall preachiness of our christian lyrics and we're going to get heavier and we're going to get maybe a little bit more complex and we're still going to give you all the dynamite twin lead guitars and all that stuff and i'm talking about striper and I, I could have chosen any of their more recent albums, but I picked 2015's Fallen, which is my favorite Striper album. Uh, this is an absolute beast of an album. It still sounds like Striper, um, but I think this is a band that said, all right, maybe the 80s limited us a little bit on what we can do. And maybe we were just kind of so excited to talk about God and, and play guitar for you guys and, and look fantastic and all that. And we're going to come out, we're still going to kind of talk about like religious themes, but we're going to, we're going to play really heavy metal now because that's really what we like. And, uh, but we're still going to look like Striper and they come back with this album. And again, this is not their only album since they kind of reformed and got back, but uh you know, this shows Michael Sweet, the singer, main lyricist, still singing up a storm. Guy's got an amazing vocals. He and Oz Fox are just riff after riff after riff, blazing twin leads all over this album. It's a heavy album. It's And it, the one thing that I love about the more recent Striper output is that if you listen to those old Striper albums from the 80s, there is this kind of real, we're so happy to be here. We're going to we're going to tell you about God and how God can be a big part of your life. And, yeah, we're going to play some guitars, but we're going to look great. And everything to me, uh, I was into it back in the day and I listened to some of those old, old albums now and I'm thinking, OK, um, it's like it's a little OTT, right? It's a little over the top. And now it's almost like Stripers, like, all right. We're still going to kind of sing about God, but we're going to make it sound really serious. We're not going to be out there all smiling and happy go lucky now where this is now serious elder statesman striper and you still got all the solos you still got even heavier riffs and this is there's no pop metal to be found anywhere on here there's really the glam has been taken out of this 
and uh, you just get these crushing tunes like Yahweh, Fall and Pride, Heaven, Let There Be Light, King of Kings, and they even do a pretty killer cover of Black Sabbath's After Forever. Would you have ever thought that Striper back in the 80s would cover a Black Sabbath song? Yeah, nope. Yeah. But, you know, After Forever, the lyrics are very Christian lyrics on that. So, uh, yeah. So anyone who ever listened to Striper back in the day and thought that their brand of hair, glam, Christian metal wasn't heavy enough, you need to hear this album and any of the more recent albums. Their, their recent album this year, uh, The Final Battle, is also damn terrific. Uh, made my top 31 of the year. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. These guys have moved on from the hair metal thing. They still they still kind of sound like it, but kicked up a couple of notches in a big way. Yeah, we should we should be letting them into the club with Mr. Big in Europe, basically. As as wow, like, the catalog is way better now than it was in the past, right? Oh, holy shit! How how did yeah. we not pick Europe? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, Europe is perhaps one of the greatest example of this right because i think most people think europe they think i mean we've talked about this a million times here on the channel they think the final countdown which is kind of their hair metal album right but the two albums that came before it is total european kind of classic metal speed metal right then they do this big album that's all glossy and whatever it's still a really good album and maybe they did like two albums after that that still kind of held on to that but after them breaking up for a while, they've come back. And I mean, Martin, we, we talked about it before. Like they have all these albums that like pay homage to like UFO, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, these serious, heavy, classic hard rock and metal sounding albums that so many people just don't even bother with because they have this image of da -da 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 Joey Tempest with the big hair. It's like, ah, that crappy me hair metal band. No, not at all. Not at yeah. all. I mean, you're and Mr. Big. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about Mr. Big, but yeah, that's another great example. Well, yeah. So I've I've got a few honorable mentions here. I'll just uh, go through quickly. So L.A. Guns. Later on, we've got Hollywood Vampires, and then Vicious Circle. This this is actually my favorite L.A. Guns album, '94, I believe it is. So I play this one quite a bit. Um, you know, Slaughter. We talked about Slaughter, but they're they're late. Uh, they're they're I think they're 1990, and then into this yeah. one, I think this is 92. So the Wildlife, and so they're like Kick Tracy, but they're the you know they're you know Kick Tracy's the baby Slaughter, but there they are still looking pretty hair metal in yep. uh, in 1992. Um, and then this is a great example. Skid Row gets heavier with Slave yeah. to the Grind over the debut. Mm. The debut's a little more of a rote, you know, dirty hair metal album. And this is a little speedier and thrashier and more kind of mainstream metal. I, I think I think people go overboard when they say, oh, they're so thrashy on this. They're not really thrashy, but it's- It's but heavy, it's more, but yeah, it's not thrash, yeah. It's, it's closer heavy. to like a metal church almost, right? It's yeah. it's going that way. It's it's like <clears> just, <throat> just better meat and potatoes, heavier, heavier, you know, lunch bucket uh, metal. And then they get a little, they do get a little grungier and slower on this one. Um, you know, warrants an interesting situation where you've gone from your, your hair metally, that one to your even more head, hair metally, uh, oh, yeah. cherry pie. Um, but then people really like this one. This one's a little heavier, right? So it's a little more Judas priest influence on that one. And then another interesting band who's in our, our extreme love, hate, uh, you know, sort of realm enough's enough as well is Saigon kick. Oh yeah. You start yes. with that one. Yep. And then the second one is this one, very creative, but they're still kind of in the hair metal yeah. realm, but Chill just around. really melodic kind of alternative kind of still hair metally little Jane's addiction to what they're doing as well. So, uh, so yeah, all great examples of man, all the best hair metal albums happen to be after hair metal was dead. Yeah. Yeah. Lunch bucket metal. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. New one for Never our heard that before. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, another band to uh, to bring up here is Winger. So right, they had those first two albums that came out in the uh, late '80s, and uh, you know, very much kind of hair metal albums, but uh, you know, really good musically speaking. Good, you know, other than seventeen, right? Some interesting lyrics and whatnot. And they they kind of broke up for a while and were kind of inactive, and they came out with that album Push which is just a terrific mature album from them that kind of takes them again, kind of like Striper into heavier, more challenging musically uh, roles and uh, a really, really terrific album. Uh, Dokken, Dokken's a weird, a weird kind of one to bring up here because Dokken, I think realized that the kind of metal that they were doing was falling out of favor and they put out this functional, which was basically their response to the grunge scene. And they put out their own grunge album and it's not very good. Sometimes again, you know, we didn't talk about that a lot here, but you have these, some of these bands that 
figured, well, let's just kind of jump into that scene. That's what everybody wants to listen to. So we'll make a grunge album. And that didn't really work for. They had Shadow Life before that, though, which is even more grungy, right? Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. So, uh, yeah, and we, we mentioned Mr. Big, uh, who, again, another one of those bands that never really fit into the whole glam metal scene, but they arrived at the height of it. And, of yeah. course, they had those couple of hit singles, right, which, you know, you released a hit single, all of a sudden you were that. Again, musically, they were very different and whatnot. And there's, there's probably a lot more, which I'm sure people will come up with in the uh, down in the comments below. So, um, yeah. but, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting concept to to look at and talk about. And Mr. Big and Extreme are, are kind of similar in that, um, you know, we were, you know, the theme of this episode is that everything was just better after 1990, right? But one department of that is uh, is the guitarists even got even more extreme. So so yeah. that's when that's when you got, you know, a, you know, a, a Nuno was way more extreme than most hair metal guitarists were in the mid 80s. Uh, and uh, and same with, uh, you know, Billy Sheehan on the bass even. Right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, so, Paul Gilbert and Billy Sheehan were basically shredders. Right. And, uh, yeah, yeah, two shredders. The drummer was a shredder, and uh, you know, and he, even the the vocalist was a specialist vocal technician in Eric Martin. Right. Yeah, it's funny we're talking about Eric Martin today because I just noticed this last night that Lynn Versace was at an Eric Martin show here locally, and she was posting videos of him singing. I think it was at Daryl's house uh, here in New York, and uh, yeah, Eric's still he's out there on the on tour right now, so yeah. playing those old Mister Big classics and covers and things like that. It's like whatever. Yeah. All right, uh, Martin, do you want to give uh, everybody a, a little preview of what's, what's in store for next week? Yeah, so it's related to this one. Um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about how how the 70s bands reacted to the death of hair metal. So we've got peak hair metal, we've got going into grunge. So we're each going to pick five examples and uh, and look at, you know, how they looked at their career versus hair metals, you know, peak and then death. Yeah. So we'll each be picking five bands from the 70s who were still active and recording going into the 90s and kind of what they did and how they responded to all the changes that were going on in music. So uh, that, that'll that be coming up at you next week. And uh, before we let him go, Martin, can you give us an update on what's going on uh, with the podcast and contrarians and books and things like that? Yeah, with the podcast, History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff, the last two episodes were worst album titles and best album titles. Um, lots of contrarian stuff going up all the time. I put a, a, up a What If MC5 put out Kick Out the Jams 2, and What If Dio put out Live at the Witch Trials, 1984, a double live album. Um, and apparently, I just heard yesterday, um, I'm going to have physical copies of my uh coffee table hardcover full color throughout um 50th anniversary dark side of the moon uh book in a couple of weeks and i've got an interview for it all already next week but uh yeah into the new year i'll definitely have copies of that uh dark side of the moon anniversary book nice very cool well, that i'm sure that's a spectacular looking book so yeah yeah definitely is those guys do beautiful designs so <clears throat> cool yeah. cool so head over to martinpopoff.com for all the info on all that uh coming up here on the channel tomorrow we've got the uk connection uh myself alongside simon Bray and stephen reed we are going to do one of our uh, uh aor melodic rock episodes the three albums we're looking at tomorrow are the self-titled debut from bad english the debut album from uk act dare featuring darren wharton on lead vocals and keyboards of course from thin lizzie and uh Peter Frampton's Premonition, uh, all mid late 80s albums, and we'll be kind of dissecting those and talking about those. Uh, we've got coming up on ranking the albums on Sunday. I will be ranking the albums of uh, Spiritual Beggars, great Swedish uh, heavy rock, stoner rock band led by Michael Amott from Arch Enemy. And then uh, we got the return of the Hudson Valley Squares on Monday, where we'll be talking about some of our favorite albums of 2022. So uh, make sure if you haven't already, stay tuned each and every day in the morning, 9 a.m. each morning. Uh, I'm counting down my top 31 albums of 2022. So, of course, I will not be participating on Monday in uh, the Hudson Valley Squares talking about their favorite albums because you got to wait and see till the end of the month for my top three favorite albums of the year. But uh, the rest of the game will be given there. So uh, that's coming up on Monday in the prog seat on Tuesday. As we uh, finish up our uh, favorite bands of the alphabet, we're going to rampage through U through uh, Z. That'll be happening on Tuesday. And uh, yeah, that's what's happening here. So thanks for watching. Everybody visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. All together, 
all the damn time. Stay tuned for part two of this episode next Friday morning. And uh, for Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. Have a good weekend, everybody. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.